His Excellency in absentia, the President of Azerbaijan, who has been our chairperson for the last three years, who is represented here by the Foreign Minister who was speaking a little while ago. Excellencies, the heads of state and government, and the heads of delegations of the non-aligned movement. Excellency, representing the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, Excellency Denis Francis, President of the 78th Session of the UN General Assembly. Her Excellency, the Vice President of Uganda, and all other government, government and party leaders of Uganda. Fellow Ugandans, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome your Excellencies, the heads of state and governments, and the heads of delegations of the non-aligned movement countries. This grouping of countries accounts for 4.46 billion people of the world. It was started by our far-sighted elders in the persons of His Excellency Sukano of Indonesia, His Excellency Jawaharlal Nehru of India, His Excellency Gamal Abdul Nasser of Egypt, and His Excellency Chou Enlai of China, when they met in Bandung, Indonesia, 1955. That time I was in primary three in the school. <laughs> the first summit of the non-aligned movement took place in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, in 1961, and was attended by Afghanistan, Algeria, Burma, Cambodia, Ceylon, Congo, Cuba, Cyprus, Ethiopia, Ghana, Guinea, Guinea Conakry, I think here was Guinea Conakry, India, Indonesia, I Iraq, Lebanon, Mali, Morocco, Nepal, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Sudan, Tunisia, United Arab Republic, Egypt, Yemen, and Yugoslavia. The emergence of the non-aligned movement was a necessary antidote to the irrational polarization of the world of that time between the capitalist Western countries and the communist mainly Eastern countries. By the early 1960s, our student group was already beginning to be active. We were the third generation of the African anti-colonial freedom fighters. The first generation had been the African-American Pan-Africanists such as Marcus Garvey, George Padamore, 
W.B. Dubois, that had been joined by those who founded the African National Congress of South Africa in 1912. By 1900, the whole of Africa, except for Ethiopia, had been colonized. This direct colonization of the whole of the African continent was the culmination of 400 years of the plunder of Africa by the evil imperialist forces in the form of slave trade and the genocide wars that went with it. The newly discovered Americas, Asia, China, and the Pacific, Australia, New Zealand, and so on, had been similarly aggressed, colonized, semi-colonized, like in the case of China, and plundered. Africa's capitulation, Africa's surrender, had been in part on account of our egocentric chiefs and kings who out of selfishness could not unite us to fight these evil people. The second generation of the African freedom fighters were people like Mze Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya, Marimu Nyerere of Tanzania, Nelson Mandela of South Africa, ETC, who emerged in the 1940s. When we therefore came on the scene in the 1960s, we were generation three of the anti-colonial fighters. We seriously studied the interplay of forces that had ultimately led Africa in such a calamity. In those studies, we used the, the instrument of political economy, which is a study that helps us to discover the fundamental laws that govern the motion of society from one social system to another. What prompts society to change from one form of social system to another? That was our big study. We had to study the dynamics of social change. In that study, we discovered that, that man, the Homo sapiens sapiens, who emerged here in Africa, four and a half million years ago, had been the main actor. Initially, this wise man, that is what Homo sapiens sapiens means, was coping with the oppression of man by nature in the form of the floods, the droughts, the diseases, the wild animals, the earthquakes, etc. These natural phenomena were, of course, oppressing other, other creatures, such as the wild animals, the plants, as well. However, those other creatures could do little or nothing to tame nature. The only thing they could do was to adapt themselves to nature in order to survive. That is how the beaver in the cold climates hibernates during the winters so as to survive. It is only a man that has the ability to try and tame the natural phenomena and harness them to improve his quality of life. Why does man have this capacity? 
It is because of the three characteristics of mind. These are a superior brain that is able to reason and not only act by instinct. A hand that can make and use tools to do work. And bipedalism, ability to walk on two legs with the head up instead of the head being down like a reptile trying to navigate among ground-based obstacles that enables man to see far and think. These characteristics enabled man to invent tools, starting with stone tools, wooden tools, iron tools, until today when he is able to make tractors and machine tools, etc. These tools enabled man to make scientific inventions that precipitated qualitative and quantitative changes in society. The invention of fire one and a half million years ago caused society to move from dwelling in trees to dwelling in caves and on the ground generally. Caves were more comfortable than the trees. The invention of the domestication of crops around 10,000 years ago, the domestication of the livestock around 12,000 years ago, the invention of the iron around 1,500 BC, the steam engine, the printing press, electricity, the railway, the automobiles, the aircraft, the automation, vaccines, the invention of penicillin, the invention of, of quinine, ETC, enabled man to cope better and enabled him to harness natural phenomena and items for the betterment of his life. Our study of political economy of creation and society, therefore, enabled us to discover that the best pr primer of changes, primer means initiator of changes in society, is the development of science and technology. Therefore, societies that move forward their levels of science and technology lay a basis for positive social change and should be encouraged by the progressive forces of the world. This encouragement should be irrespective of the social systems of the concerned societies. However, when man's inventiveness was handling the operation of man by nature, another form of operation of man emerged. This was the operation of man by fellow men. So man had two problems now. Operation of man by nature, operation of man by fellow men. This was the operation of man by fellow men. Karl Marx is one of the few analysts that seems to have tackled this new problem for man accurately. He pointed out that it was only during the time of the primitive communism, when man was still living in hunter-gatherer societies, that society was free of oppression of man by fellow men. Thereafter, all subsequent social systems had elements of oppression of fellow men of de varying degrees. This was in the form of wars of conquest, wars of aggression, slavery, imperialism, neocolonialism, colonialism, feudalism, primitive capitalist accumulation, chauvinism, etc. These elements of exploitation are totally unnecessary and only 
propelled by greed. Was it necessary for the Ottomans to block the Europeans from using the Silk Road that had been pioneered by Marco Polo when they captured Constantinople in 1453? When the Europeans were thus blocked, they started looking for a sea route around Africa, led by the Portuguese, one of them being Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal. This was a legitimate and positive response forced on the Europeans by the unreasonable actions of the Ottomans. As a consequence of that effort, Christopher Columbus reached the Americas in 1492, and Vasco da Gama went around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa in 1498. By this time, the positive efforts of the Europeans looking for a sea route around Africa had already started being polluted by the evil of slave-taking by the Portuguese. It is said that the first slaves were captured by the Portuguese in the year 1441. The two great achievements of discovering the Americas and going around Africa by sea soon proved harbingers of great evil to Africa, the Americas, and Asia. As bu bullies, as bullies, the Europeans used their progress in, in technology of shipbuilding and the use of gunpowder to conquer Africa, the Americas, Asia, and the Pacific. European looting of the rest of humanity through slavery, imperialism, colonialism, semi-colonialism, conquest, and extermination of the indigenous people in some cases went on for 500 years. Instead of humanity celebrating the scientific advances in shipbuilding, the wider use of gunpowder which had been discovered by the Chinese around 800 BC, the wider use of quinine against malaria that the Spanish had learned from the indigenous Indians of, of the Americas, the printing press, the steam engine, and all the other inventions were to spend 500 years in anti-colonial wars to expel the evil parasites. In the case of Africa, it is only in 1994 that the indigenous people of South Africa regained control of their country. So we had to spend 500 years dealing with idiotic schemes by greedy people. The oppressors miscalculate when they use their temporary advantage in science and technology to think that they can use that to indefinitely oppress other people. The oppressed will learn, catch up, and defeat the oppressor. That is why empires always all collapse. All empires always collapse. The idea of, of empires is an evil idea. I don't want to impose my beliefs on you, but as a Christian, in the book of the Acts of Apostles, 
it says that empires are evil. You go and read the book of the, of the book of the Acts of our Apostles. Saint Paul describes empires as evil. People are supposed to be free, not to be conquered by empires. We should only have free associations of nations, people of common or shared origin, interacting for mutual advantage with the peoples of the world. Therefore, we, the resistance fighters of Uganda, are flabbergasted and look down with contempt at the philosophical, ideological, and strategic shallowness of some of the actors of the world. Why not respect freedom of everybody if you say you are a Democrat? If you say you are a Democrat, why don't you respect the, the freedom of everybody? How can you say you are a Democrat and yet you want other people to be slaves? Why do you not seek influence why do, why do you not seek to influence people by your good example instead of manipulation, lectures, and threats? Again, in the book of Matthew, it says, let your light so shine before men that they see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. Influence people by example, not by threats and manipulations, Chauvinists of race, religion, tribe, or gender should stop wasting our time and opportunities with their shallow schemes. Action will inevitably invite counteraction. Oppression will invite resistance. That is why we, the resistance fighters of Uganda, only fight just wars. We obhor unjust wars. The promoters of unjust wars lose most of the time. These are wars of imperialism, conquest, domination, etc. In the 500 years of European aggression against Africa, it was only from 1912, when the African National Congress was founded in South Africa, that modern freedom fighters came forward to lead the African resistance, the traditional, illiterate African chiefs having failed to defend our sovereignty except for Menelik of Ethiopia, who defeated the Italian aggressors in 1896. It took the modern African resistance fighters, only 82 years to clear the whole of Africa of these invaders, with South Africa being the last to get freedom in 1994. In that 82 years, you had the Mau Mau in Kenya, the resistance wars in Algeria, Mozambique, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, Namibia, South Africa, Zimbabwe, ETC. We won everywhere. Our African brothers in all these wars won. But after losing a lot of time, why had the imperialists thought of dominating us in the first place? Therefore, the non-aligned movement was correct. The illogical polarization of the 1940s, 1950s, 60s, 70s, between the capitalists and communists was wrong. Why should new ideas cause tension? This was the mistake of people like Metternich of Austria-Hungary, who thought that the new ideas of capitalism that we are challenging the feudal order in Europe could be blocked by war. The Austria-Hungarian Empire ended up disappearing 
from the face of the earth, and capitalism did not stop spreading. Our stand is that the world should concentrate on the common human problems, prosperity through trade, and that's why I'm very happy to see you here. When you are outside there, you may get stereotypes about Africa, that Africa, they have no food, they are starving. Here we are dying from food. We have so much food here. So th th those images with some bad situations don't think they are represent the whole of Africa. Africa has got everything. Here we have everything. What we need from other people are markets and investments. But we shall not only sell to you, we shall also buy from you. We are not like others who want only to sell to others but not buy from them. So I'm very glad to have this big presence of, of people f from the world so that we can, we can interact with you. Our stand is that the world should concentrate on the common human problems, prosperity through trade, the advance of science and technology to deal with human problems, the environment, crime, and terrorism. The future is bright if we act right. These are indeed the, the Bandung principles of one, respect for fundamental human rights and for the purposes of the principles of the Charter of the United Nations, respect for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all nations, recognition of the equality of all races, and of equality of all nations, large and small, abstention from intervention or interference in the internal affairs of another country, respect for the right of each nation to defend itself singly or collectively in conformity with the Charter of the United Nations, Absenteeism, ab absta absta abstention from the use of arrangements of collective defense, to serve the particular interests of any of the big powers, abstention by any country from exerting pressure on other countries, seven, refraining from acts of threats, of aggression, or use of force against the territorial integrity of, or political independence of any country, settlement of all international disputes by peaceful means, such as negotiation, conciliation, arbitration, or judicial settlement, as well as other peaceful means of the party's own choice in conformity with the Charter of the United Nations. Promotion of mutual interests and cooperation, and respect for justice and international obligation. It is on these principles that the, that the NAM was founded. We, the resistance fighters of Uganda, can testify that by synthesizing the package of ideas have got very good results. Using the ideas of the free market, we use the free market principles, like this hotel is a joint venture between the government and the private sector. In some cases, the government can have some parastatals, but in most of the cases, we encourage the private sector. So we use the idea, the ideas of the free market combined with the ideas of selective state intervention in the economy in some sectors like banking, energy, 
transport, ETC, and also bring back some, some aspects of the pre-capitalist institutions, such as the reformed cultural institutions of Uganda. Uganda, although starting from a very low base, has had growth rates of 6.2% per annum for the last 37 years. We are therefore not impressed and cannot be part of the morbid, morbid, I want the word morbid, sick, sickly, of the morbid bigotry, bigotry of uni-ideological thinking of this or that type. When somebody says, this is the only correct idea, this is the only correct idea. If you don't believe in this, I, I, I will attack you. Really? The universe has been here for the last 30 billion years. This earth has been here for 30 billion years. The human society has been here for the last four and a half million years. Now you come, within 20 years, you think what you think is the only college thing? You must be sick. You therefore should not have the audacity to impose on the society you live in, let alone the world, you are narrow, uni-ideological orientation. Here in Uganda, we rejected the concept of uni-ideological positions. Our movement started as a, a multi-ideological political force. We had capitalists, we had socialists, we had Marxists, we had feudalists. They're all. That's why we call our movement movement, not party. Because a party is uni-ideological. Communist party, capitalist party, those are uni-ideological. Our force is multi-ideological because that's what fits our society. In conclusion, the strength of the non-aligned movement should be used to exercise considerable influence, particularly at the UN, for the effective transformative process for a better common future. In the negotiations for the Pact of the Future, the outcome document of the upcoming United Nations Summit of the Future to be held in New York in September 2024, we should clearly define priorities that favor developing countries by maintaining unity, solidarity, and collective coordination among our member states in line with the Bandung principles. I, will, I, I assure you all that my team, led by the permanent representative of the, in New York, has my full support to chair the Coordinating Bureau of the Land Aligned Movement. I thank you, and I welcome you all to Uganda. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. Now, you give the floor to Cuba Vice President, Chair of G7. Do you have a program here? Oh, here? OK. I'm getting trained to be chairman. The man is training me how to be chairman. Ah, now, I, I now know my job now. I now invite His Excellency Salvador Varedes Mesa, Vice President of the Republic of Cuba, 
and chairperson of the group of 77 and China to address uh, us.